So my name is Ashley Oberhaus. I work with Friends of the River. I'm the Resilient Rivers Director. And I started in May of uh, 2021, so I'm fairly new, but I'm really excited to be here. Before that, I was working as the policy manager with the South Yuba River Citizens League, also known as CIRCLE. It's another great nonprofit up in the Yuba River watershed. And I hope to bring those skills to Friends of the River and have for at least the last six months. Um, and I'm hoping to give you guys an idea of what Friends of the River does, what I do, and how you can help uh, with our river advocate work. So without further ado, Friends of the River is a nonprofit organization that has been around for almost 50 years protecting and restoring California's rivers. Um, and through education, outreach, and advocacy, we are uh, aimed to have healthy rivers, safe and affordable drinking water for all, and a thriving, sustainable economy for all residents. California has an unjust water management system. It prioritizes corporate interests over securing the human right to water and healthy rivers, which is ultimately the lifeblood of California's communities and the natural environment. And the severity of these issues is obviously increased by the climate crisis, which we are experiencing now. It's really shown by decreasing snowpack, increasing precipitation, floods, catastrophic wildfires, and of course, severe droughts. And our work addresses these important issues through key strategic initiatives. We're the leading voice for California's rivers, and we work to educate the public on why the health of our rivers is so important, what people can do to make a positive impact, and how action needs to take place now, or we will all face dire consequences in the near future. Our goal is to reach one million people, so part of today's live video is to hopefully engage more people if you don't know about Friends of the River, increase our membership, and prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion in our work. Basically encapsulating what a river advocate does or what I do on the, on the daily basis can be really in three points. Identifying threats to rivers, um, advocating to stop or change them, and then really educating the public and uh, decision makers on why restoring rivers to being fully healthy is so important and critical, especially in the face of climate change. So first, um, threats to rivers can be captured in sometimes new reservoirs or dams, project proposals. Environmental impacts of those include declining fisheries, increased water temperatures, which can cause toxic algae blooms, water pollution, and kill wildlife, um, worsening water quality, they can increase greenhouse gas emissions, and reduce recharge to groundwater, which is essential for drinking water. They are also financial boondoggles, costing water rate payers billions of dollars that could be used for other important water projects. Other threats to rivers include overallocation, diversions, um, through our water rights system and contracts, aging infrastructure, hydropower operations, water quality issues such as pollution, and climate change, of course, increases those threats and is a threat all on its own. The second step to being a river advocate and what I do every day with fellow policy staffer Ron Stork at Friends of the River is to advocate to stop or change these threats to rivers. So the first way we do that is through a program called Saving California Rivers. Through that program, we track, study, and research the detrimental effects dams have had on rivers. FOR was one of the first organizations to blow the whistle on aging infrastructure at Oroville Dam um, over 10 years before the actual spillway failure in 2017. We highlighted the fiscally and irresponsible um, aspects of the project and helped to stop the proposed Auburn Dam project. Today, FOR engages in policy, legal, and administrative proceedings, such as litigation, um, water rights proceedings, and federal relicensing of dams and hydropower operations. And we are also advocating for improved operational reform, removal, and rehabilitation of dams all over the state. Day-to-day -day activities look like um, reviewing hundreds of technical and legal reports, attending public meetings, filing comments, and when necessary, filing litigation. The second program that we work on is called Revolutionizing California Water. FOR engages over a dozen coalitions and forums that work to improve water management in our Golden State, and we advance resilient water alternatives to deadbeat dams. This includes being a founding member of the Sacramento Water Forum and um, other kinds of forums and collaboratives that really work to help promote resilient water solutions. Um, examples of those solutions could include recycled water, um, really improving the uh, pace and scale of urban stormwater capture, improved urban and agricultural water conservation, and groundwater recharge. 
So the third aspect of really advocating for rivers or fighting for rivers is educating the public to um, so they understand the value of healthy free flowing rivers and why restoring rivers is so critical for our future. Healthy rivers provide flood security, natural groundwater recharge essential to drinking water, healthy ecosystems, resilience to catastrophic wildfires, and a buffer for communities in the face of climate change truly. And what does a healthy river even look like? It's free of impoundments, has a healthy natural flow, has a thriving ecosystem with wildlife that you can see, hear, and sometimes engage with. And really, um, those rivers that you value even in your own backyard, if you're tuning in from Sacramento, you're floating on the American River during the summer, those are part portions of rivers that Friends of the River has helped advocate and keep healthy for years and decades. And we hope that people can continue to enjoy those rivers and thrive um, for generations to come. California has actually acknowledged the value of healthy rivers somewhat in what's called a 30 by 30 initiative. And so in October of 2020, Governor Newsom issued executive order recognizing the importance of protecting California's biodiversity and recognizing the importance of preserving coastal waters and lands um, in the face of the climate crisis. And so it actually included a bold goal of including 30% um, of our lands and waters in conservation by 2030, hence the 30 by 30. California was the first state to um, really proclaim this initiative along with 60 other countries. Now the United States as a whole has um, gone into a similar initiative. But what's important about that and what we hope to emphasize is the importance of healthy rivers along with conserving our landscapes. Not just coastal waters, but inland waters as well. They're important to combating climate change and resilience. So without further ado, I think that um, I want to mention that all this work requires you, requires support, requires um, our membership, and, and frankly requires an army of people that can help fight and advocate for rivers and waters all over the state. This is a critical time. And uh, Friends of the River is currently fundraising for our organization, and you can help with our work today. Um, the climate crisis is a water crisis, truly, and your support enables me, Ron Stork, and my other colleagues to fight for our rivers at the Capitol, in the court, and with state agencies. We're engaged in over a dozen active court cases, water rights proceedings, and federal administrative proceedings. And we also are only a policy team of three people with great volunteers and members um, with numerous coalitions, but we really need your support to leverage our work and, and make it possible. If you can't donate today, please consider volunteering with Friends of the River. You can email info at friendsoftheriver.org. Again, that's info at friendsoftheriver.org to help us stop more deadbeat dams, advocate for resilient water solutions and policy and legal reform, or just learn how to get out on the river and guide and learn how to be an advocate through our RATS training program. So if you want information on how to take action and help support FOR today, again, please visit our website at friendsoftheriver.org um, or email info at friendsoftheriver.org to help get involved in any of those three actions. We're now at 10 minutes out of our 30 minute lunch session. I will now open it up to questions. Um, live Q&A with me if you have questions about um, what I do, what Ron Stork does, what Friends of the River has been working on in 2021. I welcome those. Okay, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I just want to um, give a couple recommendations for people that are interested in learning more about how to be a water advocate, give a little bit more information about my background. I went to law school at UC Hastings, it's in San Francisco, and I also received a master's in law from the University of London. Those two degrees help me advocate every day for our rivers, but they're not necessarily critical to learning how to be a water advocate. Anyone can be a water advocate. You have water in a local creek, a creek, stream, river. Find your local waterway and see how Friends of the River can help you advocate for the health of that river and for that waterway. It's critical for your community. 
Um, and I think that um, I'm based in San Jose. One of the things that I've learned and learned to appreciate more um, as I've um, grown to be a water advocate, both personally and professionally, is the Guadalupe River in San Jose, California, and the associated creeks such as Coyote Creek and the nearby reservoirs, um, as well as groundwater recharge ponds. It's all in part of an important water system. And I think that um, you know it's really helped me appreciate and understand the connection between what I do in my professional life to the water that comes out of my tap, to the water that's supporting the thriving ecosystem, even an urban river in the center of downtown San Jose. It's something that um, I think everyone can really better connect with and learn how to be a water advocate through your local river. Um, other rivers that I've obviously dedicated quite a bit of time to are include the Yuba and Bear Rivers um, during my time at Circle. Um, I was very lucky and privileged to live in such a beautiful area. It's in the headwaters of our state. And the Yuba has three forks and affectionately known as the fourth fork nearby to the south is the Bear River. All of those rivers are really important to healthy headwaters. And I had the privilege of really interacting with those rivers every day, rafting sometimes down the forks of those rivers and um, seeing salmon spawn in the lower Yuba River. And it's beautiful and it's, it's a great way to connect to um, my professional work as well as my personal passion. See if we have any more questions. Great, thanks. That's a great question. So uh, British Columbia is getting hit by another really big atmospheric river right now, for those that don't know. And they are, large portions of British Columbia are actually flooded. Um, so uh, yes, that's right. Atmospheric rivers give us a lot of water, but what are they doing to our rivers and canyons? Atmospheric rivers are um, actually a, a a way for us to get the majority of our precipitation or rain or snowfall in California. But as we've experienced with the climate crisis, atmospheric rivers are actually becoming more severe and more extreme. What does that mean? It means that what's happening in British Columbia can happen here in California. We get warmer water faster and quicker. Um, and so what that means is we get a lot more water a lot quicker and that can cause flooding back up. We can't really capture that storm water runoff. Um, and sometimes that can cause, you know, mudslides, especially on burn scar areas. Um, I think that, you know, for California's rivers in particular, we're experiencing that they don't have the capacity anymore to hold all that water thanks to, you know, reservoir impoundments, diversions, and a lack of healthy floodplains. So what that means is we don't have an area for the river to grow and, and move. Um, and that lack of flexibility, um, unfortunately, due to development and impoundments of our rivers means that we can't be resilient in the face of more atmospheric rivers as we're going to be getting and we're, we're predicted to get um, in climate change. We already experienced one um, in October, which caused um, historic levels of precipitation all across California, but more specifically Northern California. And we can expect to unfortunately see more atmospheric rivers in our future. Sometimes they're also called pineapple expresses, depending on the time of year when they come. Another great question, thank you. Why are dams bad for the environment? Well, um, there are over 1,400 dams already built in California, and they provide essential water for um, agriculture and urban cities and, and populations. But unfortunately, dams also impound rivers. So what they do is they actually cut off the natural flow of the ecosystem. They worsen water quality by keeping that water warm and still in a lake fashion instead of a flowing river. That causes damage to the ecosystem and wildlife. It also um, really prevents a lot of natural groundwater recharge. So what we're learning now, um, at least in modern policy, is that groundwater and surface water are connected. So when you change the actual flow of a river, it does change the amount of recharge and what happens with that groundwater. Groundwater is really important for drinking water and for agriculture. So we really want free flowing rivers. Thanks, Richard. That's another great question. What can engaged volunteers do to help protect California's rivers? You can volunteer at Friends of the River. You can also volunteer for other watershed-based organizations, such as the Tuolumne River Trust or the South Yuba River Citizens League, or for your local conservatory. Um, additionally, you can also you know, uh, learn how to guide on your river. Um, if you're interested in really recreating on your river, you can learn how to guide. That really rafting helps bring your connection to the river. And you can learn through our training program, um, our RATS program, how to advocate at the same time. 
Um, finally, you can also contact your decision makers, your local elected officials. That's something that Friends of the River, stay tuned, has an action coming out here soon. Sign up for our e-newsletter so you can get up to date. But we send um, letters to our local officials, leaders such as Governor Gavin Newsom or your uh, elected local officials and especially water agency officials who really help um, influence the health of your local waterway. So if you are getting involved in local politics, please let us know. Friends of the River can help you with that um, because healthy rivers are really important and those decision makers really help control the impact and, and health of those rivers in their future. If we have other questions, I have reading recommendations. Um, for those that want to learn more about the climate crisis or water and you're looking for book recommendations, um, I frankly would recommend anything by Tim Palmer. He has some beautiful photos of wild and scenic rivers, especially the rivers that Friends of the Rivers help protect, um, but you know has a lot of great advocacy in those books as well. Um, also, another favorite, it's a, it's a bit of a meaty book, is The Dreamt Land by Mark Eriks. And um, it really helps with connecting the climate crisis, its impact on California's water, and especially our rivers. Some of these pictures, especially that Mark has in here, show you some things like impoundments, like you know, gold country canals um, that divert water from a river over to um, mining settlements, that some of those are still in place today. Another question. What role does floodplain management have in creating resilience? Floodplain management um, is a really, really important aspect of advocating for healthy rivers. Floodplains are the area around the river that really can get inundated depending on the time of year. So what we talked about was atmospheric rivers can cause floodplain inundation. So the river level rises up and inundates a certain area which provides essential nutrients for wildlife, groundwater recharge, um, and really helps the health of the river as it expands. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our rivers now have impoundments developed really close to the to river's edge and don't allow for that natural fluctuation. And then unfortunately, some rivers have actually been paved over or entrained. And so what that means is those flood, natural floodplains actually don't exist anymore or um, they are below people's houses. So what you're talking about is um, managing the balance between people who live by rivers and then the natural health and fluctuation of a river level. That's something that um, we were really working towards. Restoring rivers means really trying to restore those healthy floodplains. Some great river restoration projects that have happened up in the headwaters include on the lower Yuba River um, where we've removed um, millions of cubic yards of sediment to have nat more natural floodplains to help with um, endangered species such as salmon and steelhead. Other great river restoration projects happen on the Tuolumne or the Merced. Um, those floodplains really help with flood security as well. They're natural flood protectors for nearby communities. If you have a healthy floodplain, it captures that water instead of going into rivers. Parts of um, water infrastructure such as levees um, and diversions can still be sustained with healthy floodplains. It's a balance really truly in California that we're looking to achieve, but healthy rivers and healthy floodplains help us achieve that. Great, we got another great question. Can we use some of the green energy funds from the infrastructure bill to put solar panels on top of aqueducts and possibly reservoirs to help with evaporative loss and generate electricity? That's a great question, Nick. That is um, something that has come out in a couple articles recently, and I haven't explored that in much detail um, in my tenure at Friends of the River. But I'm also California chair of the Hydropower Reform Coalition, so I'm something that I'm trying to look more into is the interconnection, the interconnection between renewable energy and um, water resilience. So I think it's definitely an interesting proposition. Um, one of the issues with a lot of reservoirs is a loss of water through evaporation. So solar panels on top of those reservoirs can help prevent that to a certain extent and help increase solar power um, on our grid, which is a more resilient um, option than, of course, a lot of fossil fuel generated electricity that we um, still rely on as a state and is frankly more sustainable than um, hydropower generation, which requires um, a sustainable amount of water in our rivers um, for continued generation, which 
as people have seen this year, especially in our historic drought, we do not have. So always looking to increase, frankly, um, solar generation. And I think that if that can help with resilient um, water solutions, such as additional water conservation and loss of um, evaporation at reservoirs, I think it's definitely something that we should look into. However, I do not believe that any funding um, from the infrastructure bill is going to that specifically in California. It would be interesting to know. I could look into that more for you if you're interested in knowing more. For those that don't know, um, what Nick's referring to is the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which was signed into law recently. Um, it includes some really great amount of money for dam removal, rehabilitation, um, and uh, so Friends of the River is really excited about that. Unfortunately, there is some money in that bill as well for more uh, dam proposals. So um, there was funding for um, dams in California like sites um, and um, I think the reservoir which is going to be in the Sacramento area and Pacheco in Santa Clara County and so those are something that Friends of the River is tracking and, and unfortunately we were not pleased that that funding was included in that bill um, but hopefully you know there's still some fun great funding um, in that bill that can help improve climate resilience for California's water and for their rivers. Do we have any more questions? I've been talking at you though for 25 minutes, so to be fair, we've covered quite a bit. I want to once put out again the pitch to help support FOR. We are only a team of, of three people um, in the policy shop. Um, we're, we're putting on a big fundraiser right now. We really essentially um, need that help um, from you. If you don't feel comfortable donating today, please consider volunteering. We have a lot of work to do in 2022, some exciting opportunities, but more threats, and so we need your help. We have another question. What rivers are in danger? That's a great question. Thanks, Paige. Um, we have a number of rivers that are in danger. For those that have been supporting FOR for years, thank you. Um, you've heard about some of these. We have rivers like um, the McLeod um, up in Shasta that are part, uh, the wild and scenic portion specifically is in danger from the proposal to raise Shasta Dam. Um, while we sent letters over the summer um, and it hasn't received any additional federal funding for that project, that project's technically still on the books and so it's still endangering the McLeod River. Um, other rivers that are in danger include um, the Tuolumne uh, and the Yuba and Merced. Um, there was the rollbacks of and waivers of the Clean Water Act 401 sections on those rivers. FOR is engaged in litigation to try to help make sure that the Clean Water Act is enforced on those rivers for generations to come. And those protections are really essential for preserving the health of um, those rivers, especially impacted by dams and hydropower operations. That's a great question, Richard. Um, what other threats to California's rivers are on the horizon? Um, well, uh, for some that saw the Mercury News article this morning, um, we have a ballot initiative that may be on the November 2022 ballot um, that proposes to divert 2% of California's general funds to um, more deadbeat dams. And um, uh, that's really concerning to Friends of the River. We're tracking that. Um, that's a threat that potentially could come up in 2022. Um, and so that's something that Friends of the River and other organizations are involved in tracking and opposing. Um, and other threats to rivers that are coming up are on the horizon, um, potentially could be um, increased diversions, right? Um, as our historic drought continues to get worse, um, so unfortunately that atmospheric river event we had in October did not get us out of drought. We are still in a severe critical drought all over the state. Um, we are going to be looking at more severe solutions um, to making sure that we get humans their clean drinking water. Um, that's something that may or may not put an extra burden on our river. So Friends of the River is engaged in tracking in that as well. That's something that is going to be really critical in 2022. So stay tuned to learn more. Um, hopefully we will get some additional precipitation this winter, but um, you know, even if we do, we will still be looking to increase the resilience of our rivers and our water system to future droughts. That's a great question. Uh, what is Sigma and how does it impact rivers? 
SIGMA is the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, and it is the first groundwater law that California passed in its history as existing as a state. It was passed in 2015, and it aims to make sure that basins or groundwater aquifers are sustainably managed through um, stakeholder groups. The main, unfortunately, the main deadline for when they have to reach sustainability of those groundwater resources isn't till 2040, which is still pretty far off. Um, some basins, some regions have already started submitting their plans um, for how to reach groundwater um, sustainable management, but those are still mostly under review. Um, at the state level and Friends of the River is tracking those because those impact the health of rivers. Is FOR involved in advocating for public access to waters? Thanks Francis, that's a great question. Yes, um, so through our relicensing efforts, so uh, with hydropower relicensing, it's, a, it's an effort that happens once um, a generation really, if that, um, we have an opportunity to advocate for a number of things in a new license for hydropower operations, which includes dams on rivers. And that includes improved public access to those rivers and those waters for recreation purposes, as well as for, um, frankly, the health of those rivers. Um, if you want to find out more about our efforts for advocating in hydropower licensing, please, please email me at ashley at friendsoftheriver.org. I'm more than happy to talk to you about that. We have some great partners like American Whitewater and American Rivers, um, as well as obviously our overarching member coalition, the Hydropower Reform Coalition that advocate for increased public access to rivers. Great question, Chuck. What is the immediate impact of the recent court decision related to 401 certifications? So I believe what you're talking about is the recent decision in the district court at the federal level that came out that vacated the EPA's 401 rule under the Trump administration. That was really exciting and a great victory. Uh, FOR, as I said before, is a member of Hydropower Reform Coalition, and those entities brought litigation against the EPA 401 rule because it helped further the waiver of Clean Water Act protections um, on hydropower projects and dams um, in California, as well as the rest of the nation. This was incredibly damaging to not only the health of California's rivers, but to the actual state authority to enforce the Clean Water Act on projects that are within our state borders. So those are enacted in what's called a 401 certification or section 401 under the Clean Water Act. And the vacatur of the rule at the federal level um, really helps us make a positive step forward in trying to promote and promulgate a new rule under the Biden administration for the Clean Water Act. Um, and the vacatur itself also makes sure that the Trump rule is no longer in effect. Um, so we are now going back to the original rule um, that we've had for over 50 years um, for the Clean Water Act. Um, for 401, which just means that the state of California and other states have now the authority to issue water quality certifications for projects that need it. Um, and that's really exciting. It um, is not perfect, of course, but it does preserve public engagement in those rules and make sure that states have the authority to put those important protections on their waterways that are impacted by projects. And that is really frankly, a really exciting step, something that FOR helped fight for, and we're continuing to fight for in other um, parallel uh, court proceedings. It is now 1230. I can't thank you all enough for sticking with it with me, even despite technical difficulties. I'm really excited to have this kind of involvement um, and engagement from people on Facebook. Um, please stay tuned for more events like this. Um, and please feel free again to email us um, at info at friendsoftheriver.org or my email um, if you have more questions, concerns, and if you're interested in volunteering and supporting Friends of the River. Thank you all so much for your time. Look forward to chatting soon.